internet exchange points, but I'm going to invite uh, Mr. John Curran, who is the CEO of the American Registry of Internet Numbers, and he's going to give some official welcome remarks to this workshop. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is John Curran. Um, uh, when, I, when I heard about this panel, uh, I had an opportunity to speak with the organizers, and it occurred to me that where they all share traffic on one particular network, well, they go to an exchange point, but they, they actually exchange traffic directly with their peers. Uh, need to exchange traffic, and that's been the classic evolution of it. So where you have a lot of traffic between two ISPs in a particular city, whether that's Amsterdam or whether or not that's New York, an exchange point appears, so those providers don't have to carry it far away. Now, what's interesting when you talk about the Caribbean and developing nations is that this, um, this topic turns out to be even more important because when you can't exchange traffic locally, the place you're going to exchange it could be on the other end of a very expensive link or it could be on the end of a very long link. Maybe it's not that expensive, but it's slow because of latency getting to another country or going through an undersea cable. So the fact of the matter is that the ability to have a high performance internet in any part of the globe, in any region, is predicated on having an exchange point. Now, most exchange points historically have evolved over the largest providers realizing we have too much traffic in a city. We have too much traffic in London. We need to build another exchange point to make sure we don't have to carry it all to Amsterdam. They may not get to developing regions of the globe and say we have too much traffic here. In fact, the reality is they don't have too much traffic. There's not enough traffic in a lot of cases that they have to have an exchange point. But that doesn't, that doesn't recognize the importance of an exchange point locally in terms of performance and in terms of, of having reliable connectivity. So this is a huge issue. The fact of the matter is that you cannot let it be driven entirely by the carriers where they want exchange points. If you want reliable service, you need to think about the fact that this is a key part of internet infrastructure. It's not that difficult to operate, and it's one that developing nations can do on their own and actually attract improved infrastructure to their area. I'm pleased that there's a panel at the Internet Governance Forum to talk about this. I think it's a great panel. I hope I've helped explain why this is important to you folks, and I wish you the best on the discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, John. And at this time, I'd also like to just welcome our online participants. We're really pleased to have the opportunity to engage remote uh, participants in this very important topic. And John would have given a bit of an oversight into why we regard internet exchange points as critical internet infrastructure for emerging economies and those that are seeking to migrate to uh, knowledge societies, and we regard internet exchange points as catalysts for the development of local content industries and internet-based economic activity. So this, in this session, we propose to explore the key issues surrounding internet exchange point proliferation in developing countries, and we have quite a, an impressive uh, panel of practitioners uh, who have been engaged in different aspects of the internet, the internet economy, the establishment of internet exchange points, traffic routing, regulatory uh, and uh, policy implications for emerging co countries which are seeking to really capitalize on the benefits that can accrue from having an indigenous, a local internet exchange point. And our speakers today are Taylor Reynolds. He's a senior economist uh, for the Information Economy, the Directorate of Science, Technology, and Industry of the OECD. Um, he's a global traffic routing expert. Then we have um, Bevel Wooding from Packet Clearinghouse. He's an internet strategist, very actively engaged in IXP promotion and proliferation in the Caribbean. Uh, Packet Clearinghouse is a partner with the CTU in the establishment of internet exchange points uh, in the Caribbean. And finally, 
Michuki Mwangi, he's the Senior Development Manager for Africa and the Middle East of the Internet Society, and he is also very uh, intimately associated with the establishment of internet, internet exchange points in, the developing, in developing countries. And this morning, we propose to discuss the international traffic routing practices, domestic uh, routing practices for internet traffic, uh, the role of an internet exchange points, how you engage stakeholders, and how you mobilize them to get the buy-in to foster cooperation amongst competitors, pretty much competitors in the same market space, uh, to work on the establishment of an internet exchange point for mutual benefit. But I think, um, just given our experience within the Caribbean, we put forward the, the notion of having internet exchange points or internet exchange point proliferation in the Caribbean as an issue of national development. And um, with that, if that is the underlying principle we are seeking to foster national development, it takes on a whole different uh, perspective. And we'll be exploring some of these things this morning in this, in this panel. So without, I don't want to take up too much of our uh, panelist time. So I'm going to invite Taylor to start the discussion this morning, and he is going to be talking about um, the economics of an internet exchange point. Yeah. Taylor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the, uh, the chance to participate with you. Uh, I want to start out by saying that I'm an economist, and I'm trained as an economist. And so what I talk about today is from an economist perspective. And I think we need to have economists on board along with the technologists to understand how these things work together. <laughs> if, you, if you really want to get an economist excited, there's one word that sums it all up. And if you could uh, advance. It's right oh, it's, it's right here. Oh, it's here. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> the one word, let's see, markets. So economists love markets because everything is dictated by markets in economics, almost everything. And markets are places where people come together and they exchange things. They exchange uh, goods and services, and they either do it for money or they barter. Uh, but these markets are, are central to the functioning of society. So uh, internet exchange points are fascinating to economists because they are essentially markets. They're markets for the transfer of data. So, uh, so when we talk about uh, internet exchange points, we do it in terms of markets. Now, one of the things that I've seen here, um, I, I've been in Kenya now for I think four or five days, and we did do a trip out to the Maasai Mara. And one of the things I saw was a lot of people walking very long distances to work or to sell their goods. So this is some women walking actually to, uh, to sell their goods at a market. What you can see is that distance to the market matters in terms of their life and in terms of how effective uh, the society is. And if they have to walk long distances, they spend way too much time getting there and not enough time actually exchanging. So keeping in mind distance to markets matters, that is essentially what we're thinking about in terms of domestic internet exchange points. If we have internet exchange points that are too far away, the distances are too long for the market to be very efficient. So uh, here's some data. It's, it's a chart that shows the number of countries that do have an IXP and the number of countries that do not have an IXP. And you can see the dark blue is the area that still has not been lit up, so to speak. And it, it's a majority of countries do not, uh, according to our, our latest data. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done in order to have traffic exchanged locally. Now, I want to talk about what are some of the issues in a country that does not have an IXP. Well, first of all, uh, it, uh, internet access is expensive. So, um, and, and again, there's a lot of technical people in the room. This is more of a, an example for the non-technical people. Um, when you do not have an internet exchange, you end up having to send your data traffic outside of the country you transfer it to another provider and it comes back in. So uh, they call this tromboning because it looks like the shape of the, uh, the horn, the, the trombone. And uh, what I've shown up here is, is uh, someone who's exchanging traffic. They're from Mali 
and they might be on one ISP and they send an email to a friend who is a subscriber on a second ISP. But what happens is because ISP A and ISP C do not share traffic locally, that email has to actually travel up to France where it's exchanged at an IXP there and then come back down. The problem with this is, is you have to pay expensive international transit for that whole route. So you're paying it twice, once to get to France and once to come back from France. And those costs have to be eaten somewhere and they're passed on to the consumer. So it, if you do not have a place to, to exchange traffic locally, your internet access is going to be more expensive. The second problem you have is, is uh, latency. And this is, for those who are non-technical, latency is, is that lag you get when you talk on the phone with someone who's very far away, uh, or when you try and upload something or download something on the internet and it takes longer than usual. It's, it's a lag. And one of the problems with very long distances is you will get slower response times uh, because of the distance. And also, because you're traveling over several different hops to get up out of your country, for example, from Mali to France and then back down, there's increased potential for international congestion. So <laughs> you really are having a slower reaction on the internet because you're not exchanging traffic locally. So one of the things that I found fascinating about IXPs is they really focus on cooperation as a model. It, this is an area where competitors should get together and find a way to reduce costs for everyone because that benefits everyone in the society. So local operators can significantly reduce their transit costs internationally if they come to an IXP locally and exchange traffic. Also, one of the nice things about having an IXP locally is that it, it reduces the barriers to entry in the market for other firms. Um, it, it can help sprout the, uh, the evolution of a data center, and it's, it, it can help other companies jump onto the internet without having to buy very expensive transit. Um, it also will improve the experience for users. And like I say, you, if you are trying to access content locally and it's taking a long time to download, you'll have a much faster interaction on the internet if you have uh, locally exchanged traffic. Okay, finally, I, I'll leave the rest of this to the expert, but I, I want to talk about what is needed to have a successful internet exchange. Now, a lot of people who, who come into this very early on say, well, the key to having an internet exchange is you have to have servers and an internet connection. So they think this, the, the first reaction is the solution to this is equipment. And actually, I would put equipment and put this into practice. They also have to have a long-term view. This is not a I show up in Mali, I install some equipment, and then I leave. You have to have someone there who has a long-term vision of growing the internet. You, you do have to have people who have skills. You need to have people who have technical skills, but also skills for managerial tasks and sales and marketing. Essentially, someone who starts an internet exchange point needs to be an excellent marketer because they need to, comp they need to convince competitors to come in and exchange traffic locally. You also need infrastructure. This would be equipment, for example, servers. But it's also infrastructure such as electricity. You need to have stable electricity supply in order for the exchange to run. And finally, I I've put this in at the bottom as an economist. One thing you need is competition in the local market. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is if people cannot get to the exchange via a leased line, for any sort of reasonable price, you're going to have a very difficult time having a successful exchange. So competition in the local market is extremely important for backhaul, the middle mile, and the last kilometer. So with that, I say thank you. Thank you, Taylor, for that excellent um, introduction. I certainly love the, the analogy of the marketplace. And we see the benefits already, the reduced transit costs, reduced latency and an improved um, experience for users, enhanced efficiency of the network resources, and of course the opportunities for business and more commerce uh, in, in the whole issue of the, the information and the traffic that is being passed. So now uh, Taylor has very established a very good overview and an introduction to the topic of internet exchange points. I'm going to ask um, Michuki Mwangi to talk about his 
practical experiences in the establishment of internet exchange points in emerging societies. that um, they're going to just be exchanging here while he's setting up. I just wanted to speak about the skills to which Taylor referred in our experiences in the Caribbean. The technical part of the establishment of an internet exchange point is the, is the easiest part. Is that, is that fair? And the, you really need to manage relationships. There's a lot of social engineering. How do you bring competitors? And in the Caribbean, it's not just competitors. It is antagonistic competitors. It can be to that extent. How do you bring them together to work on an internet exchange point, which is of mutual benefit? And as I said earlier, we pitch it as an issue of national development. OK, our next speaker is ready. Uh, thank you. Um, so. Uh, I think I'd like to pick up from where um, Madam Chair left it. Um, the, the challenge of in setting up internet exchange points basically starts from the fact that uh, from the experience we've had in most developing countries is that the technical bit takes the least time and the least effort and the social side takes the most. So we, we have a saying that uh, setting up an exchange point, especially here in Africa, is 80% social engineering and 20% technical engineering. So, and uh, because of that, th the question is how do you go about uh, getting the exchange point set up? One of the things we've uh, tried to, to work on is getting the people to sit and, and talk. The competitive nature of um, internet access here in Africa, one, the challenges from the regulatory environment, and then secondly, from the competitive nature in that it's a small market, it's a small niche, and you're trying to get this number of people onto the net and get your return on investment as a business, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the cost of actually running that business as an ISP means that uh, it's a really, really small market to start with and has been for a long time. It's only changing in the recent past. And for that reason, it's created an environment where there's a lot of mistrust uh, within the community and uh, within the ISPs. So I remember at a time when uh, I used to work in Kenya and used to work for an ISP, and it was almost criminal for me to be seen talking to another engineer from another ISP, and I would actually risk losing my job if, if that got back to the management. That's how tense it was. And today I have drinks with them and it's fine. It has evolved. But if you have that kind of environment where, you know, even engineers are not allowed to talk to one another, and how do you then get the senior management to actually sit down and agree to connect at an IXP? So as a result of that, you will see that the different environments across Africa will actually um, result in different models coming up, being set up of exchange points. Now, what's happening in Africa? Well, uh, there are 24 uh, internet exchange points in Africa. I think I should say 25 now, and um, because we have one recent one, um, but I'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, of these 24 internet exchange points, uh, we have tried to classify the levels in which they are, they are at. And um, we found that across Africa, we have places where they don't have internet exchange points. Some places they will not have internet exchange points in the near future because um, of the policy uh, regime that exists where there is either a monopoly or an incumbent telco that is dominant and there is no competition. So it, you need at least three providers in a country to interconnect for there to be an, an internet exchange point. And then we found that uh, there is what we call the level one internet exchange points, which is basically boxes and wires and lights uh, showing up. And uh, we've seen a lot of interesting uh, cases where nobody even knows where the padlock is to, to lock the exchange point, and uh, nobody knows what has happened, the exchange point has gone off, and, uh, and basically it's a volunteer basis of who is closest to the exchange point and who has the time to actually go and, 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 and you know, make sure that everything is working. And, uh, and others who actually claim to have an exchange point and when you go, it's set up, there's a switch, 
uh, pray probably one or two routers, but no packets have been exchanged. So they are just boxes and wires. And then we have level two, which is basically core functionality. And this is where you find that there is an exchange point, which is actually exchanging traffic. Uh, there is somebody, at least if you send an email, you will get a reply from somebody, and they will tell you, well, I actually don't know, like, what is the statistics uh, of traffic being exchanged across, but I do know that we do have this number of members, and some of them can actually, uh, you know, uh, are sending traffic. I can tell you what my company exchanging is, but the traffic we're exchanging at the exchange point, but I don't have an aggregate. So they're, they're sort of trying to get their act together and you know provide uh, basic core functionality, which is exchanging data. But beyond that, um, uh, you'll you struggle to get additional uh, information or services at that particular exchange point. And then we have an exchange point which, which is at level three, which we say is catalyzing growth. Now this is an exchange point that has gone beyond just having a website with some basic information that we are an exchange point and is providing additional services. So you can go to that exchange point and find DNS root servers. Uh, you can go to that exchange point and find a network time server. You can go to that exchange point and get value uh, and it becomes attractive. And the members participating at that particular exchange point are not just uh, ISPs. You'll find a, a diversity in the participation. You'll find uh, academic networks. You'll find uh, governments connecting. And then you will see that at that point, it starts becoming more critical to the community. And that's where we are looking at the level four uh, I IXPs, these are the ones that have managed to get to a point that everybody is significantly dependent on the f uh, continued operational stability of that facility. Uh, the governments uh, get interested at that stage because they say if the exchange point goes down, we get affected. We've seen uh, that being a case raised within um, uh, the London Internet Exchange Point, for instance. But even more interestingly, it's here in Kenya, the government actually came to us and said, we, this facility is really critical to the day-to-day -day operations of some of our agencies. And so it is paramount that you provide the requisite redundancy uh, measures that you can put in place to ensure that it continues to operate 24-7. So that, at that point, we can say an exchange point has actually is thriving and has reached what is we can refer to as a, a critical infrastructure. So, and to start with, you'll find that when an exchange point starts, and as um, my, my, my colleague who spoke earlier, uh, Reynold, uh, mentioned that you know, when putting up an exchange point really is not the hard, uh, the, the difficult part. It's getting the people to talk. So once you get people talking, and they agree to interconnect, the technical bit is easy to 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 get done uh, that takes 20 percent so you have a fast long long period of time where you spent at uh, getting people to sit down and talking and we we had a, uh, the most recent experiences where and i'll say this is the fastest one i've seen is in lesotho lesotho is a small country uh, inside south africa and the challenge they had was that they were paying extremely high pricing to get international access through South Africa. So it's a country within a country. And uh, then the costs of uh, sending traffic via South Africa for local traffic was getting to them. And so it took them roughly about one and a half years to agree. And you know, this is a country with a lot of pressure because of the costs. And it took them about one and a half years to actually agree and. Uh, you know, the community sitting down, having meetings every now and then to agree on the structure and the model of the exchange point and where the exchange <coughs> point is going to be located. There are a couple of issues on neutrality and s the exchange point is now located at the university, the National University of Lesotho. And it only took us about two months of planning, getting everybody to get the logistics in place, having the gear in place, and again, for them, minimal investment. And 
one week of hands-on training, and as one thing that was mentioned, you need to make sure that when the exchange point is up and running, you will not experience what we've seen in some countries where the boxes and wires have been put up, and if there's a network routing problem, people go to the switch and remove the culprit until the network is fixed, and then once it's fixed, they put the cable back on the switch. You actually want to make sure that the engineers within that community are able to uh, run and uh, maintain the exchange point beyond the setup. So uh, we facilitated at the Internet Society uh, a training, five days hands-on training, and we launched the exchange point. Now, up there I have a graph which is basically was taken um, just two days after we set up the exchange point, about a week later, um, a week after, and that is just two of the top providers connecting and exchanging traffic. So it, it's not officially an exchange point, you could call it a private peering location, but this is two of the, mo the top, in the incumbent and the next competitor actually exchanging traffic. And you can see that immediately they almost had with peaks of almost half a meg of traffic being exchanged. This is a small country. The population is less than three million people, right? And that's the starting point. So the phase that goes past this now, we have the boxes and wires working. Now, how do we get them to grow to a point that they're actually a, a thriving internet exchange point? Now, that's where we start looking at bringing value to the exchange point. And by bringing that value, it means that the participants of those, uh, of those participating at the exchange point are actually going to derive more value at the, uh, at the exchange point because there is content or uh, they can get something out of that particular facility. And so I'm going to look at another example of uh, the exchange point I had mentioned earlier, and this is the Kenya Internet Exchange Point. Now, I've put up the statistics there, which is more or less the period of uh, today, uh, just a few minutes ago, and over the past one week. And you will see that the traffic is, uh, you know, compared to what we've just seen about Lesotho, this is one gigabit uh, uh, of traffic being exchanged as at now. Uh, so that's just here in Kenya. And the question is, how did we manage to get there? And the answer to this is that the community here has to be consciously involved in understanding what, it, what the exchange point is and how to bring more value to that particular exchange point. So to start with, we have government peering at this ex exchange point. There is e-government content available at the exchange point. We have content providers. Uh, that means non-ISPs. Not only ISPs connect to the exchange point, but we, ha we have people who can actually uh, bring content. We have um, the academic network, which is basically providing connectivity to the universities uh, connected to the internet exchange point. And now, uh, as more people learn to appreciate the value of the exchange point, uh, we've managed to get some providers offering to host and serve uh, Google Cache and Akamai Cache through the internet exchange point to all the participants. So it's become very attractive to a lot of people. Uh, anybody who is in this region is very interested to connect to the exchange point in Kenya because you will not only get DNS servers, but you can actually get access to Google Cache. You can now, uh, we're actually in phase of trying uh, testing Akamai, um, Akamai caching as well at the exchange point. So we expect to see this traffic growing. The last time I looked at the statistics maintained by PCH, it showed that Kenya was growing at what we'll call uh, astronomical levels at over 1,700 percent over the last 12 months just because of introducing the Google Cache and other content providers. So as, as, as it was mentioned and Reynolds uh, rightfully put this across that you need somebody who is seeing the vision a long-term vision of what an exchange point, uh, what the exchange point needs to be for it to grow. I like to add on to that and say you need actually, it does not need to be an individual, but it needs to be the exchange point itself as an entity. Because when you depend on an individual, they could be volunteers, they could grow tired or something of that nature, the jobs would 
get the better of them and uh, then you'll see that re uh, the exchange point not growing. So what you want to see is a well-established framework for the internet exchange point so that there's continuity in terms of trying to get the members aware how can we bring value to this exchange point? How can we actually bring value so that we also benefit, benefit from the exchange point? And each member will have to contribute to the growth of the exchange point. Now, um, just to, to conclude, um, one of the things that we've started observing, and this is based on some work we've been doing in Mozambique, is that by just going to speak to the members uh, within an exchange point, it's very easy to trigger their thinking of how to get value out of an exchange point. Now, um, in, the vi in the time we spend in Mozambique, um, we, we we were trying to do a study to understand why is the exchange point in Mozambique not growing as fast as what we call private peering. That means people are going off the exchange point to peer privately. And in our understanding is that in addition to the fact that they have challenges with infrastructure, the value they, were f they perceived to gain from the exchange point was diminishing. So how do you make them realize that the value that is diminishing is by the fact that they are actually not contributing to the growth of the exchange point? And so it was an interesting discussion that when we asked them, some of the ISPs in Mozambique are actually connected to several neighboring countries. So how do you get them to say, you can actually bring value. You are connected. You have an office in South Africa. Why aren't you bringing the traffic from South Africa into your office? You are already doing it to your office in Mozambique. Why aren't you reselling that traffic through the exchange point to bring regional connectivity within the exchange point? You have the value to bring to, to the exchange point. Another one was selling um, one of the key products that they provide is uh, antivirus software and stuff like that for their customers. I said, well, you do not need to sell it to only your customers. Sell it to the customers of other ISPs. Just make sure when they come to update the virus uh, database from your servers, it goes through the exchange points. They will still buy your products. And so with a little bit of discussion, we realized that the, at the end of the project, we had so many people rethinking how they can actually gain value out of the exchange point. Now, how do you calculate that value? If you, if you look back at this graph, this is one, megabit, one gigabit per second. If all that traffic, if the exchange point disappeared, that means we shut down KIXP today, all that traffic will need to go somewhere. And wherever it would go, it means it will not go through the exchange point where everybody is interconnected with one another at no cost it will have to go up through the upstream providers. Now, if you calculate at the rate of about $300 per megabit times one gigabit, that's the cost that each ISP will have to be shared across all the participants at the Kenyan Internet Exchange Point. And that is somebody who has to pay. And if you look down at how it trickles down, then it means the end user has to pay for it. So that's a cost saving that actually is going uh, to the members and also trickles down to uh, the end users who, who access this, uh, th the services. Now, here is something else that goes to the next level and I had sort of mentioned in my previous discussion. So when you have an exchange point that is operational, what is the next phase when you get to that critical level? Then you start looking at the regional aspect. So we are interconnecting traffic in within the country very efficiently. So then what next? The next phase is let's interconnect across the region because in Africa, and this was happening until, when was this, 28th September, uh, on the right hand side, 28th September at 1600 hours, just before 4 p.m. Um, from Tanzania to Nairobi, it was 400 milliseconds. You can see the, the uh, between, uh, it was between 200 and 400 milliseconds. That's a trace route from Tanzania to Nairobi. Tanzania is right next door. 
and we have multiple ways of getting to Tanzania, especially through the submarine cables. Seacom is there, Easy is there. But we actually have to go to London to connect to Tanzania and back. Now, this is a trace route from one of the providers, Simbanet, who's realized that there is value in them getting connected directly to Nairobi. And so they're a service provider in Tanzania connected into the exchange point in Tanzania, and they have a sister company connected in the ex to the exchange point in Nairobi. And now what they've started doing is making sure that their routes are visible at both exchange points. So when they trace route from Tanzania, they don't have to go to London, but come to Nairobi directly. So they're actually saving their international capacity for regional traffic. Now what we'll start doing in the future is start measuring what percentage of that traffic is going across the region. Now once we are able to do that, we are going to the next level of not just saving international costs uh, for the local level, but also at the regional level. So these are still challenges we need to address, uh, but there is progress. And a lot of this is being triggered by a, a forum which is called the African Peering and Interconnection Forum, which uh, happens every year and is an initiative from the Internet Society which is basically aimed at bringing ISPs together to discuss the issue of what is the value, what is the business and economic value of me interconnecting to an exchange point within the region, within my country, and within the region. So with that, I'd like to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that excellent overview. Um, one of the things I wanted to say, despite the level of the classification of the internet, there is benefit even at level one, but you don't want to stay at level one. It's a progression that you want to make a process of continuously adding value. And of course, there's the need to educate the stake stakeholders and keep them involved in the process. So I, I think education and awareness is, is also key to this entire process. Um, if I could just address the, the online participants. Do we have the people who are following us online? Any? Yes, we have uh, a Fiji hub. We yeah. have uh, Palestine hub. Uh, and we have Jane Paul from Burundi. Very good. And we thank you for following the discussion. Uh, it's very interesting. And so we're going to move on to our last formal presenter here, but we will certainly go into a, an interactive session. This is Bevel Wooding, and he's going to be talking about the experiences in the Caribbean in terms of establishing internet exchange points. Bevel. Hi. Good morning, everyone. And as one of the organizers for this workshop, let me say um, thank you very much for your interest in what we consider to be a very significant subject, particularly in developing nations. Uh, I will be sharing this morning on the experiences of Packet Clearinghouse in working in the Caribbean region in raising awareness about internet exchanges and also in establishing internet exchanges. So let's get straight into it. Uh, one of the things that we have uh, seen over, particularly over the past uh, two to three years, is an increasing awareness of the, the requirement to do something different about how infrastructure and I, the approach of nations toward ICT-based development is taking place. And so we are hearing comments, and I'm paraphrasing it here, that essentially go along the lines of there is a growing need to leverage technology to educate communities, develop economies, secure citizenry, and advance societies. Now, this has largely been, uh, up until very recently, cliched speeches that you would have heard in any ICT-type um, forum or environment. And when we started asking the question, to what end and by what means, uh, there started to be a new interest in what exactly is the approach that we need to take toward this knowledge-based economy and building these knowledge-based societies. And so as people realize the, the movement toward more e-everything, e-applications, e-government, e-health, e-learning, and so on, um, they started to realize that we're facing a fundamental problem within the region, and that is even though we're putting applications and services and information online, we're not getting the kind of performance or value that we would expect or that we would hope when we look at models, particularly in the developed world. And so there was a recognition that uh, there is something that has to be done about how internet services are delivered. Something has to be um, in place to make it more reliable. At the same time, as countries moved 
um, both countries and communities move toward putting more of these applications um, online and with an internet face, we started to realize there is a greater exposure to cyber threats. And the Caribbean region, because of the resource constraints and the vulnerability of the, the networks, um, is actually a target for significant cyber attack. And that has played a, a, a critical role in creating an interest and an appetite for some mechanism to improve how um, domestic traffic data and information is protected and secured online. So there is this emerging Caribbean epiphany. Greater focus has to be placed on education and awareness. Um, there is a need for new levels of collaboration, particularly between agencies and between countries. But at the same time, there has to be a move toward building capacity, indigenous capacity, improving the, the policy and legislative frameworks that govern and determine how these e-based applications and services could be rolled out. And then finally, and more significantly for this discussion, a recognition that there is urgent need to improve and strengthen physical infrastructure <coughs> in the Caribbean region. And so that has led to um, Packet Clearinghouse working with organizations within the region, most notably the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, ARIN, ISOC, LACNIC, to provide um, what this model shows here, a series of outreaches and initiatives to address these, these issues, education and awareness, collaboration and capacity building, um, working with regulators to, to develop um, appropriate frameworks and, of course, infrastructure strengthening, dealing with the issue of the traffic exchange situation in the region, which is exactly as has been discussed um, by both Renal and Michuki. Uh, a lot of countries in the region do not have domestic um, traffic exchange arrangements, and they're realizing that as more services go online, the cost, the outbound cost of introducing uh, internet-based applications is also growing. And these are economies that can't afford um, this kind of economic hemorrhage. Um, and essentially what, what, what has been termed as uh, subsidizing development in developed countries from a developing region. So this is the approach that we have taken. Uh, and it, it looks at and recognizes that there are several parallel tracks taking place. We know we're not working in an environment where um, the whole focus or issue is on internet exchange points. And the tracks are this. One, there is a with the growth of the internet and with the growth of internet access and the increase in broadband services, there is a proliferation of indigenous content. It's still not at the level that many hope or wish, um, but there is a growing amount of Caribbean content. Most of this is hosted outside of the, the Caribbean region. We're also seeing the emergence of communities of interest and advocacy groups. Uh, CaribNOG, the Caribbean Network Operators Group, started just over a year ago and, and is now making approaches to um, bringing together the region's technical practitioners. And similar to, to the example that was given earlier, you had scenarios where operators or engineers in one ISP or one telecom operator would not be seen relating to in public operators or engineers in another ISP. And that has been changing. Um, ISOC chapters are being developed and there is a move to, um, to introduce um, new online communities to exchange ideas and information. At the same time, through the Caribbean ICT Roadshow, which is an initiative designed to raise public awareness across all sectors of the need for ICT-based development, um, this initiative has been a major part, a uh, major platform, sorry, in um, our being able to get the audience and the interface to discuss the issues of domestic traffic exchange in the Caribbean region. And this has represented a, a significant outreach to government ministers, to policy makers, regulators, but also to youth, educators, network operators, and business leaders. And so this approach has meant that when we, when we introduce the notion of there is need for domestic internet traffic exchange, we're not just talking to the technical folk. We're not just making it a technical issue. Um, what has led to the, the, the success that we've seen over the last two years is that we have opened it toward to being a national development discussion and a social advance conversation. And, and this has, has proven to be very, very successful in getting the, the attention of the operators. Because now, essentially, to say I don't want an internet exchange point is to say I'm not interested in national development, which, of course, runs counter to the PR and the marketing statements of these organizations in the region. And so we have found a way to, to, to hold them to their word as it relates to 
I have a stake or a role in national development and I have a part to play in regional development by saying these are regional and national development issues. So help us to advance them in the countries that we are working in. And then finally, um, the build-out of internet infrastructure has, again, as Machuki said, been not just let's get internet exchange points established, but let's put all of the services in place that are required to create a robust Caribbean internet economy. That means let's talk to the, the let's get the root servers in, let's, um, let's put in the services, let's court the content providers. And so all of these things have been taking place against this backdrop, the backdrop of content, increasing amounts of indigenous content, new groups of users, technical communities springing up, increasing public awareness and attention to these issues, and um, the build-out of Caribbean infrastructure. A lot of the telecom providers, for example, already have an imperative to improve their infrastructure simply because of the proliferation of mobile devices. The Caribbean region boasts, in quotes, of greater than 100% mobile penetration in most markets. And so you have this burgeoning um, market of mobile users who are, are making demands for internet services and improved internet services via their mobile devices, which is putting pressure on the mobile providers to um, expand their networks, but also to improve the, the efficiency of internet service delivery across mobile devices. And so that has provided a wonderful backdrop for us in promoting internet exchange points in the Caribbean. I want to close by, by going through some of the, the issues that are, are still at play in the region. One, this is a, a map showing the cable systems, the submarine cable systems in the Caribbean. And you will note that the region is well, served, well covered, well served, well supplied in terms of submarine connectivity. The irony of this is most of that connectivity capacity does not translate into the kind of broadband services that you would expect in country. Um, both in terms of the latency and, and the responsiveness of the networks, but also in terms of the cost, which in a lot of markets still has to be brought down. And that speaks to some of the competition issues that were raised earlier. Uh, we have largely markets where you have two dominant players um, wrestling it out, but the prices between them seem somehow to, to not reflect what you would expect to see in a competitive <laughs> environment. And, um, and this is a real issue. So when you look at this map, you would say um, there is there's a lot of opportunity for capacity delivery into the countries, but we still need to see that reflected in price and access in country. Uh, transit relationships, most providers still buy international transit. Most traffic is typically exchanged through NAP of the Americas in Miami in the United States. And there is, at present, an insignificant amount of inter-island traffic uh, because of this. Um, and so using the same tromboning map, the absence of IXPs in the Caribbean region compromises our ability to build a, a robust domestic internet ecosystem and economy. And when you look at the, the, the information concerning the growth and proliferation of internet-based applications and services, you start to see why this situation cannot be allowed to continue, and that's what we feel very strongly about. Uh, we have to improve the internet economy in the region, which means improving all of the factors and levers that are required to um, change the status quo. All right, pairing relationships. Let me just pull up this, this map um, that shows you the two dominant, the, the two 500 pound gorillas in the Caribbean Sea. One is Columbus Networks. And this is, this is a map showing pairing by ASN. And you'll see that between the two major Caribbean networks, there is no direct traffic exchange. And the, the, the entities between the Caribbean regional service providers are all um, external to the region. Sprint, Telnet, Cogent, uh, that's where the traffic exchange is taking place. This research was done by, by Caribnog, one of the first research projects coming out of this new regional collaboration amongst network operators. And so you see that uh, the situation, um, even though you have significant traffic being exchanged in their networks in Columbus and in cable and wireless, um, that traffic is not being exchanged between their networks directly in the region. So where are we with internet exchange point in the Caribbean? I call this my, my, my map of, of our progress. Right now we have uh, active internet exchange points in Curaçao, Haiti, St. Martin, most recently in the British Virgin Islands, and Grenada. And in progress, 
as an active working groups moving toward establishing exchanges, uh, we have discussions going on in St. Kitts, Dominica, Trinidad and Tobago, and St. Lucia. But that does not paint the picture for the entire region because there are many more countries. And some are saying that they are thinking about it, Barbados, Jamaica, St. Vincent, Suriname, for example, uh, in active consideration mode. Um, you can interpret that as generously as you wish. <laughs> and everyone else is basically saying, well, maybe one day, let's see what's happened. Let's see what will happen in the other territories before we make any kind of investment in it. And so this is a map of where things are at in the region right now. Uh, we've learned several lessons over the last few years in promoting and building out internet exchange points, and I just want to share those with you. One, the need to engage all stakeholders, not only the internet service providers. Uh, two, present the case in clear terms. Um, we found it, for example, useful not only to say, here is a situation in Africa or Europe or North America, but we had to get information on exactly what was the nature of traffic exchange in the region without peering. What was it costing the, the, the territories? What was it costing the region? To make a case to government, for example, that you are hemorrhaging foreign exchange in an economy and an environment where you're saying you need to hold on to foreign exchange. And so we had to get the facts, not just the generic technical justifications that you typically see in IXP presentations. And this all, of course, had to do with um, the, re the reality that we were dealing not just with ISPs or technical community, but that we were opening the debate to the non-technical community. And so we had to present the case in terms that they could relate to and understand. Uh, third, the need to follow through. Uh, we found very early on that it was not sufficient to simply say, this is what IXPs is about, you need it, it's wonderful, it will do you well, but we had to follow through in the environments and say, let's see what we can do to help you and the working groups and the interested stakeholders to move along. Whether that is technical advice, um, facilitation amongst fierce competitors, let's see what we can do to advance the process. And then finally, um, communicating the notion that the IXP, an internet exchange point, is only the, the beginning. Countries, territories have to build on it. We have to bring value, and we heard that earlier. And we have to share the experience. And that's one thing that, um, that we're still working with the exchange, the existing exchanges in the region to do, which is to capture statistics and get data on what is happening. What are the tangible benefits? How is the traffic growing? What are you doing to, to get that growth? And um, how is that translating into new economic activity in your marketplaces? And with that, I thank you and pass it back over to the chair. Right, thank you very much, Bevel. And um, if I could just add a couple of little things to what he, Bevel mentioned. Um, education, you cannot underestimate the importance of education and, and raising awareness, bringing the issues to the table and engaging the stakeholders. And one of the things that we found particularly useful in the Caribbean was the engagement of our, the ministers responsible for ICT. And they provided a tremendous impetus in getting the, uh, the internet exchange points up and running. Because when we presented the information, for example, at one of our outreaches in Curacao, it was the minister who dictated that we needed to have an exchange point in Curacao. And similarly, in Grenada and also the BVI, having the political, uh, uh, po the, 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 at the policy level, that sort of support is a tremendous impetus. But really, it is about bringing the stakeholders together. It is about engaging them, allowing them to come up with the decisions that are right for them, and facilitating a process. And with that, I'm going to open the floor now to any other, uh, any of our audience who would like to talk about their experiences with internet exchange points. We have someone from Cuba first, two, three. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I first of all want to thank Will Bernadette for uh, um, and the panelists, the excellent presentations. Almost all has been said. But nevertheless, I want to ask the panelists to please, if they can, uh, expand a little bit on three subjects. The first subject is one of, of cost. It's been said that one of the potential cost saving of internet exchange point is the possibility of, by aggregating traffic of different ISPs, this allows to negotiate better uh, agreements with uh, tier one 
uh, providers, sometimes even uh, to get it passing this agreement from transit agreement to peering agreement. Uh, I want to ask the panelists if they have some experience about this happening someplace and well, it can uh, expand about this. The second thing that I want the panelists to expand a little bit is that, as already has been said, uh, the IXPs is the first step, but you need to add value, you know, by hosting. It was mentioned that in some of these IXPs has been hosting some services like the Google and Akamai cache, but also it was mentioned the need to put uh, root servers, but also the hosting of content. It could be, you know, and especially content that is de designed for local consumption, you know, from e-government or e-education or something that. I also would like to ask the panelists if they have some information regarding this has, uh, or best practice, if this has been done in some of the IXPs. And finally, the third area in which I'd like the panelists to expand is of course that the next step is regional IXPs, that the potential and the value that regional IXPs as an extension uh, of this uh, technology is, uh, well, has been mentioned already. I would also would like to ask if, if the panelists, if they have some experience in some areas of the world in which regional IXPs has been established or been negotiated, and please, if you, they can share with us uh, around this. Thank you. All right, I'm going to ask Machuki to address the issues. Uh, I think you've covered some of those in, within your presentation, so it's a case of really expanding on the issue of the costing, the adding value, and the regional um, benefits that can accrue. Okay, um, I think the first question, uh, the first uh, area of elaboration is uh, if ISPs have actually come together to negotiate for cheaper capacity with upstream providers. Well, um, <coughs> there has been efforts in, in especially here in Africa, to try and do that. But I think the the model that ISPs operate in tend to um, create more more tension and uh, or sort of lack of a middle ground for them to come together than there there is the opportunity for them to come together. And the questions that uh, people tend to ask mostly is um, if you negotiate uh, for, you know, as, as a unified group to buy the capacity, um, you know, uh, how, how do you work out the billing model? Because, you know, it's not that individually each person will be billed, but you're looking to buy bulk capacity. How do you work out the expansion of that? So th those finer details tend to elude uh, a middle ground for ISPs to collaborate. Um, I remember here in Kenya we had, we tried that at the end of the monopoly that ended with the incumbent around um, 2003, 2004, the ISPs tried to form an association to set up their own gateway and buy capacity, but that didn't really work very well. Mistrust. Everybody felt that they would get a better deal by going to somebody else vis-a-vis. -vis. So that mistrust tend to uh, be quite a big factor in trying to get this result. And as a result, if you look at the way exchange points end up being set, they are often neutral entities away from the ISPs, such that uh, they would prefer a neutral entity, and a f even the location of the exchange point has to be neutral, uh, because the perception the ISPs will always have is that um, if it's located in one of our members' facilities, that member will have undue advantage over the rest. But in the reality of it all, it's really, that's not the case. But it's the, the, envir the competitive environment that creates those perceptions, and not the real uh, hard reality when, when it comes to the operational aspects. Now, the other uh, point was on hosting content at exchange points. Now. One of the things that is very important for exchange points is that they should never engage in a business that competes directly with the potential member. Now, the way an IXP remains uh, <coughs> operationally sustainable is by gaining more members so it can meet its operational costs. Now, if it starts going into the business of hosting, it means that they are killing the potential business of a potential member 
and that in itself will start alienating the exchange point from its membership. And so it will be moving away from being an exchange point into being a competing business. And so that is often not encouraged. However, you can host uh, content that brings value, and that's why we are talking about DNS root servers, network time servers. Uh, maybe a Google cache if you can find a mobile or such, uh, such. but you're bringing value, not providing business. Uh, uh, so there has to be a distinct and clear uh, 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 policy with respect to that. The last thing was on regional exchange points. Now, um, there's been a lot of ongoing discussion about what really is a regional exchange point. Now, uh, if you look at the way exchange points are built, what makes an exchange point attractive and successful is the membership and the value you get by participating at an exchange point. So if you go to an exchange point and there is no traffic, you're exchanging less than one megabit of traffic, there is no value. So if the exchange point is valuable, then it will attract more people. Now, um, if you look, I'll give an example. If you look at the London Internet Exchange Point, do you call that the UK or British Internet Exchange Point? or a regional exchange point or a global internet exchange point. It has actually evolved across all the three levels. It started as a national exchange point. It became a regional exchange point when other people from other countries uh, across the neighboring uh, 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 countries came to peer there. And then people from other co continents started coming to London. So we have operators from London, from Latin America, from uh, Asia and Australia and the US peering at the London Internet Exchange Point. So it's gone through from being national to a global exchange point over the years. So it is difficult for you to find a location and go and say, we are going to go and build the regional internet exchange point there because the, at the starting point, and if you look at the graphs I showed of Lesotho, the only two people peering, only the value they bring there is what will be attractive to the people participate, uh, to, for other people to come and join. But a, 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 a national exchange point can evolve from being national to regional to global based on the value it brings to itself. It attracts as the years go by. So it is very difficult to wake up one day and say we are going to go and build a, a regional exchange point in this location. The factors have to be, it's like an airport hub. It's really difficult to work, work up one day and say we're going to build this massive airport hub. There must be enough incentive and traffic attraction for that to happen. I, I think I've answered all the questions. Yes. Thank you, Th that, that was, um, I really love the evolution you know, of the, the Internet Exchange Point. Uh, we had a question. Could you identify yourself, please? Um, uh, my name is Troy Edelin. I'm with USAID. Yes. Um, we, I've been involved. We're, we're helping Afghanistan set up an IXP. Um, and I just wanted to point out a, a few things which the, the process, the experiences, has um, helped us understand. And um, uh, the IXP in Afghanistan is actually going to be set up in the same building, the same room as the exchange between the mobile network operators. So uh, for that fact, um, uh, one thing that hasn't been pointed out yet is that it's not just about mobile internet, the advantages of an IXP, it's about all, all, mo all mobile services to the extent that mobile network operators can um, uh, route their traffic via the internet to uh, towers, right? So, um, and. I was originally driven to it because of a, of a mobile internet system using IVR, right? So it wasn't actually mobile, mobile internet that we were concerned about. It was just um, uh, achieving efficiencies for regular mobile services, voice, SMS, MMS, uh, and so on. Um, the other thing I think that um, it would be really nice to hear the panel respond to would be this question of, um, of governance of, I think that uh, a colleague um, uh, Mwangi touched upon this briefly. But just, I think that as IXPs begin to um, lower costs, increase speed, um, human behavior and businesses follow that, right? So, so then uh, it becomes pot uh, potentially possible for, for example, an online uh, news service with video to become sustainable and to become popular, become accessible, become influential and in politically speaking, right? So once, once that, is, say, has been achieved, then the IXP services, its, it's functioning, 
become has a has a political dimension to it because like in Egypt for example they might want to shut it off oh. if if our IXP is functioning successfully so um, a, a, a technically a economically successful IXP raises questions about well how what kind of national asset is this what what about sovereignty in, in uh, which sovereignty questions which are raised by the fact that um, we have a more dynamic and affordable and accessible internet. Um, again, this is a, it's, it comes across as a content question, but really I think it's kind of a governance question. <coughs> I wondered if you could address, address uh -huh. that. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off, uh, because that actually is the flip side of the, the coin. When you say let's make IXPs a national development issue, the flip side of that coin is well, now it takes the attention of the national government in most cases and national community, and it places a different priority on who governs and who watches over and who controls this internet exchange point. Um, we have largely promoted the, the open and neutral model for internet exchange points. Uh, what you're describing is a scenario that comes when the internet exchange point actually grows and starts to change things in the marketplace. And um, we haven't gotten to that stage yet in the Caribbean, but we are already seeing, even in the formation of the exchanges, um, governments and regulators taking a role in saying this is a priority now you the service providers and the telecom industry move toward it in the last two exchanges that was, were established there were two interesting but different models that were, were taken or approaches that were taken in the case of the british virgin islands uh, the regulator had to issue an edict that said there will be no um, exportation of domestic bound traffic in the bvi which was their way of of saying to the service providers, I need you to engage in domestic pairing. And they made it an, an offense under the Telecom Act to um, exchange any domestic bound traffic externally. Now, that was not an advisable approach. We did not want to see the hand of regulation coming into the establishment of exchanges, but they felt that in that environment, there was no other choice. The providers were simply not prepared to come to the table and discuss traffic exchange. Uh, one actually told me directly that they had better things to do with their time. Um, so you have that as one scenario in the British Virgin Islands. In Grenada, the threat of regulation was sufficient to get them to the table. If you don't do this, and if you don't do it in this time frame, I will be forced to regulate. And um, that was sufficient. They got together, and, um, and Grenada's exchange point set was set up literally months after that command was issued, after being discussed for just about a year. So, so you have this, this situation where as it becomes increasingly important to um, not just government service delivery, but general service delivery, um, we, we anticipate that there will be a, a new kind of scrutiny. And in anticipation of that, we actually have been talking to and working with the regulators in the region to uh, introduce, them, introduce to them the notion that um, regulation is not always about constraint. Regulation is about development. As, as obvious as that might seem, it is a novel thought for some. And, um, and that's the conversation that we're having right now, knowing that as there is more traffic, as there is um, more services that now depend on this facility called the Internet Exchange Point, um, those who are responsible for regulation and governance must take a more mature look at their role and responsibility in making it stable and reliable. Sorry. Right, thank you. Yes, there's one in the back and then Akil, and then we'll take uh, any comments that we have online. Right, would you identify yourself, please? Thank you. My name is Narani Nimpuno. I work for Netnode, and I have several hats. One is that we're uh, the oldest exchange point in Europe, and the other is that we're a root server, and I will try to, to speak to both of those. Um, so first of all, I'd actually like to congratulate ISOC for the fantastic work they do in, in Africa, the work that Michuki and, and his colleagues are doing are really making an impact in, in Africa. Um, and if there's anyone you need to talk to to get find out more about exchange points, do grab Michuki because he is, he is an expert. Um, right, so I just wanted to, uh, I think in the last question, Michuki actually touched upon the neutrality aspect and it's something that's, uh, that's very important. So for example, when, when our exchange point in Sweden many years was set up, it was actually because the two large telco providers wanted to interconnect, but they didn't trust each other. Uh, one came with a cable basically and the other one said, I'm not going to let your equipment into to, um, our facilities. Uh, and that's actually where 
the academic network, network um, stepped in and said, well, we can put a switch here and we can uh, interconnect you. And that's actually what was the first step. So that aspect is, is very important. Um, if an exchange point is neutral uh, and the people can be trusted, I think, think uh, um, it, will, it will be more likely to succeed. Um, and the other is also what, what's, what's important to, to um, understand is that most exchange point models, certainly ours, we don't actually interfere with any of the traffic. We don't go in and, and look at the traffic even. We don't, it is up to the ISPs connecting to the exchange point to do what they want. Um, another thing I thought I'd, would be worth clarifying because there's been a, a lot of talk about whether or not a nation has an exchange point or not. And what's important to keep in mind is that we're talking about network topology. So first of all, the internet doesn't, doesn't uh, act according to national boundaries, uh, but also something that is geographically close or distant doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, network topology-wise, close or distant. So that's very important in, in trying to, if we're looking at reducing, um, increasing speed, reducing uh, latency, it you look at where it makes sense network topology-wise to put an exchange point. Um, and so an exchange point is all about localizing traffic, right, and reducing transit costs. Um, uh, another thing, well, two things, uh, and that is, is that an IXP has to keep growing, uh, and that is why it's important to have um, stability at the exchange point, to have uh, dedicated staff, because not only will it allow, um, allow it to grow, but it will also then provide a stable contact point. So my other hat, so to speak, uh, I'm wearing is, uh, is that as a root server operator. So we operate one of the 13 DNS root name servers uh, in the world. And we are looking at um, uh, Africa, among other regions, to increase the root server footprint. And we, we're talking to uh, Michuki and others uh, in Africa. And what we find, and I think Michuki has, has given that um, uh, told the story about some of the exchange points. Um, you put in the infrastructure, but then there's no one there really to maintain it. Uh, and if you want to bring an IXP up to that last level, I don't remember if it was four or, f or five, as a thriving IXP with critical inf internet, critical infrastructures, sorry, um, you need to have that because that's also uh, where others, other value-added services will be easily added. So, for example, as a root server operator, we're a non-profit organization, and we can find ways of funding the installation of a root server, but for us it's important that we have um, a stable contact point and, and technical, technically competent people at the exchange point. So I just wanted to, to add that, and I don't know if there are any, any comments or responses to that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that, uh, those comments. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Akil. Adiel, uh, CEO of, uh, of Afrinic. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the issue of, of exchange point is, um, is a critical issue in, in our region and for internet development in general. And uh, the, there is a, a lot of meeting, a lot of workshop, a lot of discussion about uh, setting up exchange points uh, in our region. Uh, but if we look at the, the map of Africa, and Mishuki talk a little bit about that, it has not been evolving that much for the past three years. Uh, uh, why? And, and I think that <coughs> we, we may want to look closely at, at the why <coughs> it's not making as much as progress. Those who are already established are progressing, but the, no new ones are coming to join very as we will, we will expect. And if you look at the map again, you will see West Africa, for instance, there is uh, almost nothing there. Uh, um, so is there any uh, political uh, network infrastructure or network topology uh, impact on, on this? Uh, for instance, most of the, f the, the, the French-speaking country has uh, a strong monopoly. Even if the monopoly is still not there, there is only one operator that is connected to the fiber, and all the other go through that operator. And for them, they have the perception that they don't need an exchange point. They, they, they all go through the same operators. So how do we? present this thing economical, to make it economically vi viable. Let's not forget that in most of those countries, there is no local content in, uh, uh, for, for them to, to, be, to be willing 
to, to peer locally. So we have to present this, as Mishuki said, as a long-term perspective for the uh, development of the, of the internet and come up with and work with the operators and, and, and show them their, their, their interest in, in peering locally and the impact. We have um, organized the AFPIF meeting recently where traffic engineering, we show how traffic engineering can solve a lot of issues related to uh, connectivity costs. We, we talk a lot about connectivity costs, but how can we really do that without gathering and, and taking policy big policy decision because that would take time. Um, uh, those are very uh, specific points that uh, we need to address uh, because there are many programs here to improve the, the, the network in Africa. Uh, Nurani talked about the root server copy. We, we, it's a project that we have launched two, three years ago. Uh, we have install only one root server through that pro program in Africa. Uh, and, and why? Because uh, we want exchange points that are working, but few really match the criteria that, that we have. Uh, so yeah, we can complain all around the world and say, oh, we want root server in Africa, but do we have the infrastructure to do that? Topology-wise, do we build the network as uh, uh, internet or we are extranet of the, the rest. We connect to the world, we don't interconnect locally. So we, we, we need to work more on that and the community is important. I think Kenya has made significant progress because the community was strong behind it. The engineer were socially tied together, they, they work together, they don't look at the policy uh, aspect. Uh, they also benefit from the uh, satellite connection at that time where most of the operators use satellite. So there's, there was a need to, to, to to op optimize that. So we have to probably present the exchange point in a different way for those countries that are not taking it and looking at where exactly is the, pro is the, is the problem. Um, it may be somewhere where we are not looking at really. Yes, thank you very much, Adil, for that, those excellent points. Uh, I, again, I cannot under, uh, overstate the need for education and public awareness and speaking to the constituents in language that they understand. Um, and as I mentioned before, in the, with the Caribbean experience, engaging the politician at the political level to help in steering that sort of direction. I mean, you've spoken to the, to the issue of competition. Is the market liberalized? Those are the questions that you have to ask. And those sort of questions, you know, you need to, to raise it at the, at the political level. There must be a political will, or else we, those countries that have not benefited from having uh, uh, an internet exchange point or a level four internet exchange point um, will continue to, to be, you know, uh, at a dis severely disadvantaged. Can I just go on online now and see, get some comments and some experiences very quickly from our online participants? We have a question from Palestine. Mm -hmm. First, we would like to thank the panelists and organizers and uh, they have a question, what is the best practice for managing and regulating the local exchange point? And they have another question, we need to know from your experience about the regional exchange, is it better than having only a local exchange points? And also they have another question, we need to know the cost saving in percentage in traffic and cost. There. Machuki, do you want to take it, the first one? Best practices for governance of an IXP? Okay, I think there were two questions in that. There was the managing and the regulating. So the managing model is, is, is a tricky one because um, you, I would prefer not to prescribe a, 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 a management model uh, for the exchange point. The most important thing is for the stakeholders to come together and agree what model works for them. The default and most acceptable and most successful uh, model that works for internet exchange points is a non-profit. There are commercial IXPs, but non-profits tend to go well in terms of one, gaining the confidence and support of the operators, and two, also being accepted uh, by 
future members who come to join that you know it's a non-profit the interests are not commercial they are for the benefit of the community and the stakeholders that are involved so a non-profit model tends to win the case uh, tends to be more acceptable and tends to thrive better in the experiences we've seen. But w that doesn't mean it's the only model. Uh, we, there's a study I tried to do some years back to see what's the uh, how the diversity of uh, exchange points in, in, in Africa, and I realized that uh, we, we actually do have quite a diverse number uh, 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 models in terms of where we have those that are uh, run as non-profits, those are run by the university, and some are actually were set up by the government. So the models will be there. The question is, what do the stakeholders uh, think uh, or are will actually appreciate as a model that works for them. That's going to be the fundamental thing because the, those are the people who will be participating at the exchange point. Their interests need to be taken care of. So if they are not part of the model, then th the exchange point will not serve in their interests. So that's the fundamental thing that needs to be considered in set looking at the model. When it comes to the regulation side of it, now government does have a role to play. We cannot say that government does not have a role to play. And the experience we've seen with this uh, with especially here in Kenya is that initially the exchange point was just for ISPs but when all governments go e-government and they need to connect to the exchange point they start asking the question so are we buying services from you or what exactly are we doing with you and because it's an exchange point it's voluntary that means you actually come and peer the model becomes tricky so the model that you pick should allow for a broad-based type of engagement, not just for ISPs, but also governments can actually have a seat on the ISP board and participate just like every other member. So the model you pick should take those uh, future considerations on board. The second part related to the evolution, uh, she's asking about regional IXPs, but I think that was explained. It's an evolution. You cannot decide that you will, you're will. you starting off, you're going to have this thing. Um, so I think we'll just pass, or you want to comment? I just wanted to emphasize that you cannot start at a regional. Uh, you can go to a regional exchange point. You know, you can go to London or Amsterdam or Decix um, right. or Netnode. You know, the, the big exchange, you, you, you can come to Kenya, for instance. <laughs> um, um, but that only resolves uh, your issue when you're connecting to content that is available there. You will still need access to the local content. Now, that means you cannot Essentially, a well-designed ISP will be to con connected to more than one exchange point, a national one and a more regional one. The value here will be, do you want to grow your national exchange point to be a regional and then a global exchange point? So those are the questions that the management of the IXP should consider. Right. Sure. Just five seconds to, to talk about the regulation side uh, of, of, of the exchange point. I, in many regions in Africa, in fact, if you look at the regional economical commission uh, test, they are start adding exchange point as a need. So the policy side is there, but why is not picking again? Because those regulators are seen as protecting the the, the monopoly. So the other are not coming in because it's coming from the top again to favor probably the monopoly or creating a way for government to control the traffic. So it's not only about regulation, but it, it's really about the mindset about the internet business itself, how it works really. Why do we need the, the exchange point? And, and that, is, that is also some, some area where we need work to educate regulators. Can I just add one? So the, 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 the point is that the, the sh Kenya is the only IXP, I think, in the world that has a license by regulation, from the regulator. And it was a battle with the regulator to get them to let the exchange point operate. So the, the point is that exchange points should not be licensed. They are, they are not licensable. It's like saying you're licensing the switch you have in your office, you know, because you're exchanging traffic there. 
and that an exchange point is just a switch. So if you license the switch in an exchange point, you're pretty much license, requiring a license for every other switch in every other organization because they're exchanging traffic. But uh, looking at it from a, a, a you know, and this is where the question of how does the government get involved? Uh, uh, f uh, f in our case, the re licensing sort of s becomes that role of how the government gets involved. But I think uh, looking at a multi-stakeholder partnership is more of an ideal approach than a licensing uh, approach. Thank you very much. We're wrapping up now, but we will take one more intervention from our online community. We have a question from Cameron from Internet Society. Uh, they are saying, can the Internet Society of Cameron support technically and financially an establishment of an IXP uh, in a developing country? Can the Internet Society of Cameron supports technically and financially an establishment of an IXP in a developing country? And that question for Mr. Mwangi. Okay, so um, again, this goes back to the whole governance issue. It will be very uh, risky uh, in, in all manner to try and bind uh, the exchange point to uh, an existing uh, organization, it will be a stakeholder's decision. Uh, the stakeholders will have to come and, uh, and say, do we think the ISOC chapter in Cameroon is the most ideal organization to be the host and the entity that is responsible to run the exchange point? So the answer to that is they should talk to the community. The the, the ISOC chapter in Cameroon sh should actually facilitate the discussion within Cameroon and let the stakeholders make the decision that maybe the chapter would be the most ideal or they should set up a separate entity. So that's a discussion and that's the 80% of the social engineering that really needs to take place. Right, thank you. We have, we will take two more very quick interventions um, and thereafter I'm going to give the panelists uh, about 30 seconds just to make some final comments so they're two quick less than a minute interventions please the first one and you I identify yourself please yeah, I, I am James from Tanzania uh, perhaps I should just quickly say in Tanzania we have established about four internet exchange points because of the size of the country but the challenge which is on, on, on ongoing now is how to make them uh, a handshake. So is the interconnection, direct interconnect between the, the four internet exchange points. Uh, perhaps my quick call here is, could AFRINIC, ISOC, or a PCH collectively or individually offer technical assistance to us to do that business. That is my quick intervention. Absolutely, yes. I am answering on behalf of the stakeholders. Definitely, yes. Um, my name is Nkemweke. I'm from Nigeria. Um, in my country, Nigeria, I know we have an exchange point, and the Telos is keeping local contents local. But what exactly I don't know is the benefit to end users. And I know too that in Nigeria, the in, uh, exchange point there has uh, the backing of the regulator. Thank you. So the, the benefit to the end user in Nigeria. In, in Nigeria. If I can just jump in, um, the OECD is actually undertaking some work with UNESCO and ISOC, where we, we did a joint paper that looked at the development of internet infrastructure in a country and the development of local content. And we were able to show statistically that countries that have a more developed internet infrastructure also produce more local content. So we weren't able to determine uh, the causality, which, which comes first, but we think it's more of a virtual circle where more local content makes the internet, internet more attractive uh, and once the internet there's more internet infrastructure that makes local, local content providers provide more content. So I, I think that's an interesting um, area for further research, but we do see a connection between infrastructure and the, uh, the amount of local content. 
Thank, well, I think that about wraps it up. I'm, I'm just going to give some 30 seconds. I'm down to 30 seconds now to each of our panelists just to make some very, very quick interventions and you know wrap up the points that are most uh, that, that need to be made at this point. Okay, I think in closing, my, my closing remarks will be that internet exchange points are uh, catalysts uh, of internet development in that they, th there are a lot of um, other, um, I'll say, actually an ex internet exchange point creates um, what I would pr like to call an ecosystem around it. Without an exchange point, the ecosystem does not exist. The moment you establish an internet exchange point, an ecosystem, uh, an internet ecosystem starts growing in that you have all these other industries and sectors that will hinge themselves on the success of the internet exchange point. And as a result, the impact is that you have better internet access, you have uh, you know, uh, better penetration of internet access, and everything else that we're trying to achieve with resp respect to internet access and growth will be achieved. Uh, because you'll see that a CCTLD, for instance, a country called top level domain name, will actually work better if there's an internet exchange point. Without that, it doesn't work really well. So it is really, really important that we look at having internet exchange points so that they can create this ecosystem that will catalyze the growth that we are aiming to see. Uh, just really quickly from my side, I would say there needs to be some emphasis on competition and on making these markets more competitive. The OECD has largely been successful in making OECD countries competitive for telecommunications, but we're very surprised and, and saddened to see that some OECD countries have monopolies in other countries. So we, we see them lasting, particularly in, in parts of Africa. And so one of the findings of this local content paper is that OECD countries need to, to promote competition as well in non-OECD countries where they might have um, other interests. I just want to echo the fact that internet exchange points are a fundamental component in the creation of a healthy, robust domestic internet economy. Uh, my belief is that wherever traffic can be exchanged locally, it should be exchanged locally. There is no country or jurisdiction that is too small. And we've seen that in the region. We have cases where now in small countries such as British Virgin Islands and Grenada, uh, Google, Akamai are actually making approaches to locate their caches there. There are users who have just as much right as users anywhere else on the planet to access the same quality of internet service that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that is an excellent uh, wrap-up. Well, you've shown the appreciation long before I had the chance to ask you to, but I also want to, to pay tribute to our online participants. Thank you for joining us. We appreciated the comments and so on. And uh, let's go out and build internet exchange points. And, and where we have them, let's build them. We really want to see them, all of our internet exchange points, operating at a level four. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you.